Good morning, everybody. We are about to start our first, our next installment of Creator Lutheran Church Lenten Reflections, a monologue for Nicodemus, a leader, read by Cynthia, and um, our opening dialogue and our questions will be once again shared at the end. So um, I'm going to open it up. about to one so you're on my name is nicodemus i too played a role in the passion story of our lord but i'm afraid that my role was mostly that of an observer i wanted to be involved i tried to be involved but i held back let me tell you my story i'm a ruler of the people both in politics and religion i'm a member of the sanhedrin which is the governing body of israel our Sanhedrin is somewhat like your Congress, only we have more responsibilities. We are 71 men who not only make laws, but enforce them and hold court for people who break the laws. Your modern idea of separation of church and state is strange to me. In Israel, it was the priests and religious leaders who ruled the state. In my time, the Romans had conquered Israel, so they had the final say in all matters of government. The Roman governor was the final authority. At the time of my term of office, the governor was a man named Pontius Pilate, a ruthless individual. The Sanhedrin had the responsibility to rule the country, but we always had to be careful to follow the wishes of Rome. The Sanhedrin is divided into two groups, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. I am a Pharisee. As for my personal life, I'm extremely well off. You would probably call me an aristocrat. I'm also a teacher. I specialize in teaching the Jewish law, or Torah, as we call it, and the scriptures. That's how I became involved with Jesus. I know enough about God's word in the scripture to realize that Jesus was preaching a vitally important message. I'll get into that later. Though I had wealth and power, I can tell you that since I met Jesus, nothing has been the same. I heard rumors about a wandering preacher in Galilee who was stirring up the masses. When I heard what he was preaching, I became interested because the man had recaptured something we had lost in Judaism. If you go back in Israel's history, you discover that our religion is originally based on God's grace. God, out of his love and mercy, made a covenant with Abraham. God rescued my people from Egypt, and because of his love, he claimed us as his own. What was originally central in our religion was God's love and grace. Unfortunately, by my time, we had lost that center. We had become proud in our faith and decided that because we had God's law, we were special and better than other people. We had forgotten about love and hum humility. But Jesus in his preaching recovered that vital center. He attracted the hypocrisy of our people and proclaimed against God's word. He recovered the center of grace and proclaimed a vital call to discipleship. That's how I came to meet him. I heard about his meetings. I knew he had something, so I searched him out. I'm embarrassed to tell you now, I went to see him by night. A man of my position and standing, I couldn't admit I was talking to a country preacher who was challenging the systems. I went by night so that no one would know. That seems to be the story of my relationship to Jesus. I always came to him by night, hiding and following him from a distance. Jesus and I talked that night, and he, he shared some startling ideas. He confused me thoroughly with his teaching about being born again and about the Son of Man coming from heaven to save all of humankind. I knew just enough about what he was saying to get thoroughly confused, and yet he fascinated me. I could tell he taught God's word. I was intrigued and drawn to the man. I never spoke with Jesus again. I thought it was all too risky for a man in my position to be seen with him but I watched him closely. I had servants report to me on his every deed and teaching. I finally came to believe in him. What he said was true. I'd studied enough to know that. I believed that Jesus was God's chosen one, our Messiah, but I kept my distance. I believed, but I couldn't give up what I had. I couldn't make that total commitment. I followed, but from a distance. Once I even helped Jesus. A few months ago, some of the Pharisees in this Sanhedrin were getting disturbed and angry about Jesus, so they sent out guards to arrest him. But the guards were so amazed when they heard Jesus speak that they refused to arrest him. 
what they came back and told this to the Pharisees, the Pharisees exploded with rage. They were going to condemn Jesus right on the spot and be rid of him once and for all. I was there, so I asked them, does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? That stopped them, at least that time. That's probably the reason that I wasn't informed of the night they arrested Jesus to Gethsemane. Jesus had come to Jerusalem on a Sunday during the busiest time of the year. It was during that Passover celebration, which is our biggest holiday in Israel. It's hectic time in Jerusalem anyway. And to top it off, Jesus came to the city. He had been creating a, quite a stir for the past few years. And then he came preaching and teaching right into Jerusalem. He entered on a Sunday and he was greeted by the crowds like a conquering king. On the following days, he taught in the temple, often questioning how to understand the faith. He knew our tradition better than we did. Everyone was talking about him. Crowds were following him and most of the Jewish authorities were wondering how to get rid of him. We in the Sanhedrin have the responsibility of keeping order in Jerusalem. So we were watching Jesus very closely. I in particular was watching him. I was trying to fulfill all my various responsibilities during Passover, keeping track of Jesus and all the while hoping he wouldn't get into trouble. Looking back on it, I should have known that we were going to arrest Jesus. It should have been obvious to me. Most of the Sanhedrin wanted him stopped. I should have seen it coming, but I didn't know about the plot to trap him and arrest him. Nobody told me anything. In fact, when they finally did arrest him, I was at home in bed. I didn't suspect a thing. I was awakened in the early hours of the morning by a servant of mine. He came in shouting that Jesus had been arrested, that that had already been tried by the Sanhedrin and was now sent to Pilate for sentencing. I couldn't believe it. I certainly should have been informed of such actions. I dressed quickly and ran to the court building to see what was going on. When I entered the building, the place was disturbingly quiet. Many of my fellow Sanhedrin members were there and some were gathering in a sinister type of triumph. I saw a few sneers directed at me and I knew something was wrong. I soon learned what had happened. My servant had been correct. Jesus had been arrested, tried, and was now before Pilate. A trial in the middle of the night was illegal against all our laws and customs, but they had done it anyway. Now Jesus was before Pilate. I had been deliberately left out. I knew this couldn't have been a fair trial. If anything, it was legalized assassination. I prepared to object, then I stopped. I looked around and saw that all were staring at me. They were waiting for a word from me so that they could pounce on me and devour me too. I felt like Daniel in the lion's den, only this time God had, had not closed the lion's mouths. My fellow officials had turned into lions waiting for me to protest. They never got that word. My throat tightened, my mouth couldn't speak. I knew I should speak out, but I couldn't. I froze and backed off in a daze. I found out later that all of Jesus' followers did the same. We all deserted him. I went home and locked myself in my study. I was immobilized. I knew I couldn't keep silent, but I didn't dare speak. My servants kept watch on what was happening. They reported to me about the scene before Pilate, the whipping, the verdict, and finally the cross. I knew I had to do something, but there was nothing I dared do. The Christ of Israel was dying on a cross, but I was paralyzed. My power, my prestige, my wealth couldn't help me. If anything, they hindered me. I couldn't risk them to help Jesus. I held on to my power and my status and wealth, and I learned their emptiness. Finally, Joseph of Arimathea came. He was a friend of mine, also quite well-to-do. He told me that Jesus was dead. We talked and we decided we would bury the body secretly for fear of the law, Jews. We went to Pilate and arranged to be given the body. We gathered up his lifeless body and we carried him to a tomb. I remember the chill of that afternoon, not just the cold, but a terrifying chill that freezes the soul. We took Jesus' empty, Jesus's empty form to Joseph's tomb. Imagine the two of us, two of the most powerful men in Jerusalem, sneaking through the outskirts of the city with the body of our Lord because we were too terrified to act in the open. We buried him according to the traditions of our people. We took excellent care of the body. It was just a fine preparation. I love the man. So did our, so we did our best. 
They tell me now he is resurrected, risen from the dead. The rulers dismiss it as an idle rumor. I have to search it out, find out for myself. I pray to God that I let nothing hinder me from that. I still remember that day, my emptiness, the body, the chill. It pains me to think about. If I can tell you anything at all based on my experience, it is follow the Lord and cling to him. I'm a man who is hesitant enough that finally the only expression of my faith I could give was to bury our Lord. Please don't let anything get in the way of following Jesus. Cling to him, cling to him as faith. That's what really matters. Thank you, Cynthia, for being able to share that with us. We will now continue by looking at our litany. From Psalm 1, 19. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. I have sworn an oath and confirmed it to keep your righteous rules. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept my freewill offerings of praise, O Lord, and teach me your rules. I hold my life in my hand continually, and I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever, for you, they are the joy of my heart. I incline my heart to perform your statutes forever to the end. Let us pray. Gracious God, you are the source of all faith and hope. Grant us the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would be filled with a deep abiding faith in Christ Jesus. Help us to follow him in all that we do and to be open to the world about our trust in him. Let us seek his life and love just as you seek us and call us into a relationship with you and our neighbors. All this we pray in the name of Jesus, who is the life of the world. Amen. And your reflection questions to ponder, now that we've heard about Nicodemus's story, and from the time he talked with Jesus through the trial and the burial of Jesus. What held Nicodemus back from a deeper following of Jesus? What holds you back from a deeper following of Jesus? Judaism at the time of Nicodemus had become a religion of law, Torah. Was the Old Testament originally rooted in law or grace? How do you know? Or maybe both. Just a little hint there from our Lutheran understanding. How are Jesus' teachings the same and how are they different? Christianity is not just knowing about Jesus. It is following Jesus in all aspects of life. Nicodemus knew who Jesus was, but he struggled to follow. Do you struggle to follow? Where might Jesus be leading you today? Do you ever feel like you are following Jesus from a distance? What might help you get closer? What might clinging to Jesus look like in our day? How did Nicodemus' statute, stat status, affluence, and wealth get in the way of his relationship with Jesus? In what ways have you experienced those same stumbling blocks? So God bless and keep you on this Wednesday night in Lent, and we will continue to connect with one another. Our next worship will be on Sunday morning in our live stream.